Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Living Off Campus webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which Queens is located, where I and soon you will study and reside in. Queens University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. As students and staff, we are grateful to live as uninvited guests upon these lands. To acknowledge this traditional territory is to be cognizant of its longer history of colonialism. It is important to recognize this land's significance for the indigenous peoples whose practices were tied to and continue to develop in relationship with the land. It is also important to understand the long-standing history of Kingston that has brought us to reside here. This significance exists beyond the historical context and is still ongoing. We need to be mindful of our present participation and actions on these ancestral and treaty lands where we teach, learn, and live. As settlers, we understand that it is due to colonization that we can enjoy these lands and the opportunities it has provided. We understand the privileges from which we have benefited and understand the responsibility we have to dismantle the perpetuation of colonial systems. In the future, we strive to represent aspects of his indigeneity within our programming and will express our appreciation through continuous efforts towards diversity, inclusivity, and equity. We encourage you to learn more about the history of Indigenous lands in Kingston through the Office of Indigenous Initiatives and the Four Directions Indigenous Student Center using their website or on-campus resources. Now, let's move on to our speakers for today, starting with myself. Hello, my name is May. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the student lead for the off-campus community. I am responsible for the programming and supporting of first years who live off-campus. I am sure I will see so many of you this year, and I'm so excited to get to know each and every one of you. We also have Mel, the orientation and transition coordinator on the back end to answer your questions. If you have anything you'd like to ask, put it in our Q&A box at the bottom of our screen, and we will get to them at the very end. Now, I'll pass it on to our other speaker for today, Mary Ann. Hello, thank you so much for having me. As mentioned, my name is Mary Ann Tierney, and I am the off campus living advisor here at Queens. I use she, her pronouns. I have worked in the post secondary environment in various student service positions for the last 17 years. I am also a tenant and have a good understanding of the Residential Tenancies Act. If I'm ever not sure of something, I'm pretty good at getting the answer and will always get back to you. So back to you, May. Thank you, Marianne. To remind everyone, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the SEO YouTube page in the next few business days, as well as the Student Experience Office website under First Year Foundations webinars. And now let's start our presentation and I'll hand it back over to Marianne. Sorry about that, I was muted. Okay, um, thank you again for having me. So as the off-campus living advisor, I help all Queen students and do my best to answer any questions related to off-campus life. I meet with students about where and how to look for a rental property. I help students understand the Residential Tenancies Act and their rights as a tenant. I am unable to provide legal advice, um, but I can provide support with rental applications as well as lease reviews. I also offer tips on how to live with others, as well as landlord and housemate conflict resolution. So if you are comfortable sharing, um, if we could turn to the chat, if you don't mind, what have you heard about Kingston housing, housing searches, landlords, et cetera? So if you don't mind just dropping something in the chat, I would appreciate it. No takers? Okay, that's okay. No worries. I will move forward. Oh, I'm seeing some stuff pop in. Okay, there must have been a delay. Thank you. Um, we've heard that housing is hard to find, heard that it's very difficult to find something for short term rentals. Residence is not guaranteed. Most houses are for six to seven people. Okay, excellent. Okay, thank you so much. 
and I'm sure that I will be able to comment on those as we go throughout the presentation. So common terminology. So as you navigate the Kingston rental market, these are some common terms that you should be aware of. Um, and I am going to take some time to just explain each one for you. So a lease agreement is a contract between you and the landlord. It is a commitment. And leases typically are a one-year lease term. The lease sets out the rules of the tenancy. And it is important to note that with a fixed term lease, if you are planning to move out at the end of the fixed term, so the date stated on the lease, you still need to give a minimum 60 days notice prior to the end date of the lease that you want to leave. If you want to stay, no notice is required um, and you are not required to sign a new lease. When you are ready to then move out, you are required to provide a minimum 60 days notice. An application, um, you, you need to submit an application in order to rent an apartment, room, or house in Ontario. Landlords will generally ask for some combination of a rental application, a credit check, verification that you are a student, as well as references. An application is essentially a summary form of a renter's information and provides relevant information about the possible tenant to the landlord. When you are interested in a specific property, you will need to complete an application. And this is common for most landlords as well as the larger property management companies. Each process though may be a little bit different. So it is important um, to do your research on that and understanding what each one is looking for. So a deposit, um, so when your application has been accepted, you viewed the property in person or virtually, and you have received a lease, you will then be asked to pay a deposit. This deposit is the last month's rent and will be applied to the last month's only. It is important to note that a security deposit or damage deposit is illegal in Ontario. If a tenant damages something and the landlord wants them to replace it or fix it, there is a different process for that. And it is illegal for landlord, landlords to ask for security or damage deposit in advance. A guarantor or a co-signer is a person who agrees to take responsibility for your rent if you are unable to pay it. And some landlords will ask for a guarantor. Um, so for tenant rights, RTA, um, this is legislation within the province of Ontario that protects tenants and sets out the rules for both the landlord and the tenants to follow. There are some exceptions that I will touch on a little bit later in the presentation. Apartment, house, and condo are often the types of rentals you will come across here in Kingston. And utilities means heat, electricity, and water. In Ontario, electricity is also often referred to as hydro. And these are monthly costs. And it is important to note that depending on the rental property, they may be included in your monthly rent, but they also may not be and could be extra costs that you need to anticipate or plan for. An eviction is a formal procedure that is managed by the Landlord Tenant Board of Ontario. Every landlord must follow a series of steps to legally evict a tenant. If a landlord verbally asks a tenant to leave or writes them an email or note asking them to leave, this does not begin the formal eviction process. And then bylaws, just wanted to mention, these are city municipal laws, different from provincial and federal. And an example could be property standards or noise bylaw. So your living situation. So each of you need to decide what type of living situation works best for you and your budget. If you are living with others, please take the time to have an honest conversation with one another. You need to be able to live together. So it is important that you are talking about your definition of clean versus theirs. How will chores be handled, etc. Everyone has, again, a different definition of cleaning. So it is really important that this is discussed in advance. Um, and you wanna keep this in mind when you're picking your housemates. How are chores being managed? If utilities are not included, how are these getting paid? Who will set up the account and take the lead to notify when payment is due? Chatting about guests and respecting each other's space is also really important. We have a housemate agreement form on our website that students can use to open the lines of communication on many of these topics. It's also really important to understand joint and several liability. 
this is when you all sign the lease together. You are all financially responsible. So the lease doesn't typically say that you're each paying for a room. It states you are renting a property. And this is also why it's extremely important to pick the right people to live with. So common problems between housemates. So again, cleanliness is a big one or one person always being the one to do all the cleaning. We recommend chatting about putting together a chore schedule and working, to, working together to ensure it is kept up. Excessive noise and parties is sometimes also a concern. We all come to university for different reasons. So again, it is extremely important to interview housemates in advance and find people that you will be compatible to live with. For utilities, you are, uh, you are unable to set up a group account, so one person needs to set up the account and collect the money each month and, and ensure the bill is paid. Chatting about common possible problems in advance and how you will navigate this is really important, and open and calm communication is key. And I'm sorry that I constantly bring that up, but it is um, a huge concern and a problem that does arise um, with housemates. I see it every day. So that's why I just need to bring that up again. Um, and again, this slide is here for a final reminder that you do need to have those conversations with future housemates in advance, preferably before signing a lease. If you have signed a lease, then please have these conversations before you move in together. I do offer conflict mediation. However, some in, in advance solutions are opening the lines of communication right away, establishing house rules and expectations early, talking about chores in advance and creating that chore schedule, agreeing to talk to one another as concerns arise as opposed to ignoring the concerns and letting them fester. And from my experience, again, open and calm communication is the most effective tool. So the rental process. It is really important that you do know your rights from start to finish on this slide, this is what the process does look like. You need to decide which type of rental situation you want and what, and if you are living on your own or with others. You wanna make sure you have your documentation ready, set up property viewings and submit applications. Once you receive a lease, be sure to review it and that you also understand it before signing it. Once your lease is signed and your deposit last month's rent is paid, it's done and you're ready to move forward. So starting your housing search, it is super important to note that once your lease is signed, you can't get out of it. A lease is a legal binding contract. If moving in with people, again, who already maybe have a house and they were looking for another housemate, before you make an agreement or sign a lease, make sure you're meeting with all the housemates in advance. Kingston is expensive, so please be aware of that. Please also note that the perfect property actually does not exist. So please give yourself as many options as possible and use all of your resources when searching for a rental property. Everyone's needs are different, but a main common need is the proximity to campus as well as budget. The more amenities you need or want, the more expensive it technically or sometimes can be. It is also important to note that the closer you are to downtown or to campus, also likely more expensive. If you are willing to have a bit of a walk or take Kingston Transit, this may help you expand your search as well as your budget. Be prepared for the possible need of providing a guarantor or a co-signer. Have your documentation ready and note that it is very common to be asked for confirmation of enrollment. And if you are asked for this, you can get it through your SOLAS account. It's also important to know your tenant rights and be prepared. So housing pricing. So navigating the Kingston rental market, again, can be challenging, but it's not impossible. And I'd say you want to treat it almost as if you would a job interview or job applications, right? Those take time and you have to put a lot of work and energy in it, into it. It's the same thing for a housing search. So Canada is in a housing crisis and unfortunately Kingston is not really that affordable right now. Lots of people are moving here and currently Kingston does have the lowest vacancy rate of rentals in Ontario. A healthy vacancy rate is 3.8% 
and currently Kingston is about 0.8%. As a result, rental prices do go up because of this. So as you can see from the slide, these are just some examples. So a room in a shared home, so that would be as if you have maybe three or four roommates or more, um, a bedroom in a shared space, so you're sharing kitchen, you're sharing bathrooms, you're sharing living room, ranges anywhere from $750 Canadian to about $1,200 Canadian. A one bedroom or bachelor apartment ranges anywhere from $1,400 Canadian to $2,400 Canadian and up. And two bedrooms is approximately $1,500 to $2,400 and up. Okay. And then there's also the three and four bedrooms listed there as well to give you just um, some base points. So these prices are based on a variety of factors. So living with others is more affordable. And the closer, again, that you are to campus or downtown, usually the more expensive it is. It's also really important to note that Kingston may be more expensive than people realize. So that's why we also want to make sure that you have an understanding of costs of room versus one bedroom. So it's also important to note that the landlord mindset changes when you get close to campus. Landlords are thinking per room, not necessarily the whole house. The farther from campus tends to be less expensive. More amenities typically, again, means more expensive. You also need to consider other costs than just rent. So utilities, internet, groceries, cell phone bills, etc. A lot of people um, in my conversations expect that apartments are going to be furnished. So this is rare, um, not necessarily impossible. There are some places out there that do come furnished. Um, again, usually a little bit more expensive. Um, but again, a little furnished is a bit rare, so you do need to budget for furniture. Tenant insurance is sometimes required and is approximately $20 to $30 a month. And if it is not required by the landlord or indicated in your lease, it is recommended that you still get it. So preparing for a showing. So you always want to make sure um, or ensure that you've researched the landlord, that you know the application process of the particular landlord and have all of the documentation ready. You want to make sure that you prepare your questions in advance. If you're not sure what to ask, you can reach out to our office for some standard questions um, that you should be asking during a showing. These are also available on our housing resource package through our website. But again, you're always welcome to reach out and we can send that to you. Don't rush. Be efficient in your research and please do your due diligence. You also want to make sure that you're being professional as well as polite because you want to come across as the most suitable tenant. So what to look for during a showing. So a showing is when you view the property before signing a lease or before making any commitment to it. It is extremely important to view the property prior to sending any money or before signing the lease. A showing is an opportunity for the landlord to sell you on that property. So you want to look like, does it appear to be well taken care of? I do want to mention, and the rat is here on my, or the mouse is on my screen as a reminder, um, but all major cities in North America, including Kingston, have rats and mice. They aren't all over the place, um, but if properties aren't taken care of, then you might see them or signs of them um, that there might be some issues with them. So you do want to look for broken windows, water stains on ceilings, or also signs that the landlord doesn't take care of the property. You want to make sure that you are looking for mouse traps, mouse and rat dirt. If you see signs of this, there are likely some issues with the property. If possible, um, you do want to talk to current tenants. Why are they leaving? Are there issues with the house? And ask them what the landlord is like. Are they? Is the landlord responsive to maintenance requests? Um, something to keep in mind, though, is that talking to current tenants is typically only possible when you do an in-person showing and the current tenants are still living there and are present during your viewing. You can also ask the landlord if they can put you in contact with the current tenants, but keeping in mind that the landlord is not obligated to do this. 
there are also privacy concerns and processes that the landlord would have to go through in order to share contact information. So again, getting in contact with current tenants just may not be possible. But I like to bring it up because if you are here in Kingston and you go to view a property, sometimes tenants are there. So alternatives um, to in-person showings. So in-person showings are always the preferred method. Um, so again, you should never sign a lease or send money without viewing the property. But for students out of province or out of country, or you, know, you live on the other side of Ontario, um, in-person just may not be possible for whatever reason. So a virtual showing is the next best thing. And it's important to note that a virtual showing is not a video posted online or received via email. So a virtual showing or virtual walkthrough can be done through FaceTime or similar app. So it's just like right now, um, you can see me. I could, if I wanted to, take my computer for a walk and show you Mitchell Hall, which is where my office is located. And then you could take that information of what you're seeing and compare to Google Maps. So again, you would treat the virtual as an in-person showing. If possible, use a larger screen, tablet, or laptop as opposed to your cell phone. The issue with a virtual viewing is that the landlord is actually controlling the viewing. So you really do need to take the control back, almost pretend like as if you're there in person, right, physically beside them, and ask them to open that door or open that drawer, or can you point the camera to the ceiling, right, because you want to check for the water stains and the broken windows and things like that. This is an opportunity for the landlord to sell you the property. So it's really important that you are asking lots of questions and that you get a good understanding if the property and what you see will work for you. I also suggest to students that you request that the landlord show you the outside of the property, right? And this is especially during those virtual showings. Um, this way you can see that street view and what it's like. It also allows you to take all of that information, compare it to Google Maps, as well as the photos shared on the original listing to ensure that things match what you were being told. So unfortunately, housing fraud and scams do happen. And this slide indicates some of the key things to identify um, if it is a scam. So scam artists actually are really good at their jobs um, and can hide things quite well. So they use fake email addresses. Um, they often claim to work for Queens or a real estate company. They do use real pictures of Kingston properties, which they've taken from online. Um, and they also offer to provide fake documents to verify ownership. And some things to look for with that is if the landlord is pressuring for money to be sent in advance of a viewing, red flag. Repeated pressure for money to be sent before leasing or property viewing, again, red flag. Using sayings like, I have others that will rent without viewing, red flag, just end the conversation and move forward um, or move in another direction. Improper grammar and spelling mistakes are also common that it could be a scammer. And often sometimes the email name that they use doesn't match the name on the listing. And that can also be a red flag. So you really do need to trust your gut. Um, if it seems too good to be true, it likely is. So please do walk away. Please make sure that you are educating yourself on rental scams as much as possible. International students and students out of province are often the ones typically scammed. The big takeaway here is that you should never send money without viewing the property, whether that's in person or virtually. And you always want to view the property to confirm that the ad is legit and that the property does in fact exist. So again, always ask for a viewing. I can't stress it enough. Students will often say, well, I'm not in Kingston, so I can't view it in person. And again, that is fair, but we do encourage students to see if you do have a friend, maybe that's local to Kingston or living in Kingston that you trust that could view it on your behalf, that's an option. And again, if that's not possible, you can ask for a virtual showing. And again, that virtual showing is that face-to-face, real-time video call. Many scammers will send a video and say that is a virtual showing. A video is not a virtual showing. 
often students are asked for a deposit to view the property. That is a big red flag. Do not send money in hopes of viewing the property. You should never be asked to send money in order to view. And if you do, um, that's illegal in Ontario. So walk away. If the landlord gives you an excuse as to why they can't show you the property, that's a red flag and likely a scam. Again, do your research on rental scams. We do have some information on our website. If you see a post, research the company or landlord. Call the company to confirm if the property is available. Does the number on the ad match the Google search for the company online? If the numbers don't match, you can call the number from the company website not from the ad. And the reason I point that out is because some scammers will use names of common property management companies, but upon further research, information like phone numbers, et cetera, do not match. So it is really important that you're doing that extra research and doing your due diligence. So when to start your search. So if you are looking for a property for September, um, I would highly recommend um, that you suggest to start looking now. So common leasing cycles in Kingston are May 1st to April 30th, um, September 1st to August 31st. Typically, you will see that one-year scenario. And sometimes you will find an eight-month lease. So another common leasing cycle is September 1st to April 30th. So in Ontario, with a fixed term lease, even with a specified um, end date, a tenant is required to give a minimum of 60 days notice prior to the end of the lease that they are leaving the rental unit. So keeping that in mind is important. In situations where tenants have not signed a new lease and their current lease is now month to month, they are also required to give a minimum of 60 days notice that they are leaving the rental. And it's also important to note that leases are typically 12 months and short-term leases are rare. And the reason I bring that up about the month to month and the minimum 60 days notice is if you are looking for September 1st, definitely start looking now. Just also keep in mind that we're not quite at that minimum 60 days prior to September yet. But definitely do start looking because we're getting pretty close to that time frame. So where to start your search? Um, so we do have a resource package available on our website. Um, there's the QR code. You're more than welcome to scan that and download it. Or if you just go to the OCLA website, um, all that information is there for your reference. Please make sure that you're using all website and resources and check them all regularly. So in that housing resource document package, there's again, multitude of resources. Um, a variety of links that we do know that students are using. So please make sure that you're not limiting yourself to just one of those links, but using all of them. There's not just one website that landlords use to post. So again, our resource document will direct you to several options. And it's important to regularly schedule time in your daily routine to review the listing link. Setting aside, you know, 30 minutes or even hour a day to send emails and arrange viewings will make a big difference in your um, rental search. So if we could just go to the chat, um, in Ontario, landlords can ask for a security or damage deposit. Is that true or false? Okay, I see the answers coming in. This is amazing. People are listening to me. So that's wonderful. Um, the answer is false. So in Ontario, landlords can only ask for a rent deposit, which is one month's rent and will be applied to the last month's rent. So for submitting applications, it, again, it's important to note that landlords and property managers will typically ask interested tenants to submit an application. Each company or landlord does have their own process. Um, some still asks for it to be a paper form. Many have 
you know, website that you submit to. In addition to the application, you may be asked to submit proof of enrollment, student ID, a guarantor, and references. It is important uh, to note that you are not required to submit a deposit when applying to a property, and you never send money without seeing the unit. So for lease agreements, be sure to familiarize yourself with the Ontario Standard Lease. There's also a copy in our housing resource package on our website. In Ontario, the landlord must use the Ontario Standard Lease. Landlords do have a right, though, to attach additional terms. You always want to make sure that you're reading the lease and any additional terms and that you understand it. I can review leases and point out if anything stated is not enforceable or if I notice any red flags. So if ever, you know, once you get your lease and you have questions about it or you don't understand, you're more than welcome to submit that or book an appointment and we can definitely review. And landlords can only ask for the last month's rent as a deposit. Landlords, though, can ask for a key deposit. And typically it ranges from $25 to $75 and only used if the key is lost or not returned. And then if it's not used, they need to return that to you at the end of your lease. Okay, so back to the chat. Um, you sign a one-year lease agreement that expires on April 30th. If you don't sign a new lease, you need to move out on that date. True or false? Okay, so the answer is actually false. So all fixed term leases in Ontario do go month to month. So again, if you plan to move out at the end of your lease, you need to provide a minimum of 60 days notice prior to the end of the lease date. If you plan to stay, no notice is required and your lease does go month to month. And it is important to note that with joint leases, you are treated as one group. So one tenant can't just decide not to stay and the others go month to month. And if you ever have questions about that when the time comes, we can always chat. So it is really important that you are reading the lease agreement and you're understanding it before you sign it. This slide lists some of the common things that landlords will ask for, even though they should not be. So some landlords will ask for you to sign an N11 form when signing your lease. An N11 is an agreement to terminate at the end of the lease term. A landlord cannot require the tenant to actually sign an N11 agreement to end the tenancy as a condition of agreeing to rent the rental property. A tenant does not have to move out based on this agreement if the landlord required the tenant to sign it when the tenant agreed to rent the unit. Landlords also can't just come into the rental unit. They are required to provide 24 hours notice. If there is flooding or, you know, an emergency happens, then there are exceptions to that. Again, please ensure that you're reading and understanding your lease agreement before you sign it. It is a legal binding contract. If you don't understand it or have questions, you're more than welcome again to submit it to our office for review. It's also important that you keep a copy of your lease. So often students will reach out to me with questions. I then ask for the lease and they advise they do not have a copy. So sometimes, depending on what the question is, sometimes in order for me to answer it, it is related to what's stated in the lease. Um, so that's why sometimes I will ask to reference the lease so that I can give you the best um, information that I can to my knowledge. Um, so it is also not just for my purposes, but for your own, it's actually really important that you're keeping a copy. You can always ask the landlord for a copy, but really you should be keeping a signed copy for yourself right from the very beginning. It's important to reference it throughout the tenancy in case you have questions or want to confirm what you agreed to. So I just mentioned that the N11 on the previous slide, and this is an example of the form here. Some landlords will use this form to try and force you to move out by signing it. And there are some exceptions if you are renting from Queens and community housing is your landlord, as Queens does own some off-campus rentals. 
Um, so that information is stated very clear on this form um, if there's an exception to that. In the province of Ontario, leases do go month to month. So some landlords use the N11 as a tactic for you to then sign a new lease as opposed to you not signing a new lease and going month to month. So again, if ever you're presented with an N11 and you're not really sure what to do, feel free to reach out and we can chat about that. So exceptions uh, from the RTA. So it's, it is important to note um, that you will not have protections under the Residential Tenancies Act um, if you are renting with a direct family member of the landlord or the owner of the property, you're living with or sharing a kitchen with a direct member of the family, or you're renting and living with the landlord. So sometimes those could be like the room and board situations. So that means then um, if there are issues, you would need to go to small claims court as opposed to the landlord um, tenant board. So moving in, it is really important that you are protecting yourself. Our office does have a move-in inspection form that you can use to help you with the process. It is important that if the landlord is not with you during move-in day, that you do your own inspection of the entire unit before you move any of your belongings in. Take pictures of the property and note any damages. You're not doing this necessarily so the landlord will fix the damages. I mean, if they do, that's fabulous. Um, but what you're doing by doing this is that you're protecting yourself um, so that you are not charged for them when you leave the property, right? You don't want the landlord to then come back and say that you caused the damages. So that's why it's really important to do your own inventory. Utilize the form available on our website to do this if your landlord's not present and make sure you take photos. If your lease states that you are required to get tenant insurance, then this is required and you do need to get it. And that needs to be done in advance and you need to show proof to your landlord that you have the tenant insurance in order to get your keys. So common notices from landlords. So these are common notices on the slide um, from landlords. I'm not going to go into detail. But if you ever have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. It is really important that you're doing your research and educating yourself on your rights as a tenant. Um, it's also important that with any of the common notices that landlords may use, it's important to know that there is a process for each one of them. Okay, and processes do take time. So a landlord can't just kick you out or evict you. Okay, there's a process for that. And they would need to file with the landlord and tenant board in order to do that. And the process to get a hearing to determine if they can evict you can take several months or maybe even longer. So again, the key takeaway here is there is a process for every form. Okay, back to the chat, please. So you are a tenant. Rent is paid on time and in full monthly but you've broken one of the many terms and conditions your landlord has added to your lease. The landlord has found out and is threatening to evict you as soon as next week by changing the locks. Can the landlord do this? Yes or no. Excellent. I love what I'm seeing in the chat. So the correct answer is no, they can't. They need to complete the appropriate form and file with the landlord and tenant board. Again, the process can take several months to possibly a year. And if they do file again, like there is a process for that, and then the landlord and tenant board will also notify you that this is that a um, claim has happened and you'll both go to the hearing together um, and given a date. Um, so again, if that ever happens to you, please reach out and I can um, further direct or give you some information. But again, um, they need to complete the appropriate form. They can't just email you and say, you need to move out by, the, by this date. That's not how the process works. 
So property standards, I do just want to mention that Kingston does have a property standards bylaw. If you are having issues with your landlord regarding some property maintenance or they won't fix something that is broken, there may be a way to force them to fix it by submitting a form complaint through property standards for review. And if you ever do have issues with a maintenance or property deficiency, the first step is to always notify your landlord or the property management company. Written correspondence is preferred. Um, notification by phone is acceptable. But either way, you always want to make sure that you're keeping a copy of all your correspondence for your records. Because if down the road things go to complaint um, or the landlord tenant board for other various reasons, you want to make sure you have all your documentation. And if your request is not resolved to the landlord, then you can file the complaint with the city of Kingston. Again, if it falls under the property standards bylaw, um, there is a form on their website that you would complete. And if you're ever not sure if that is the right process, depending on the issue, you can always reach out to me. We can review the situation and determine if you should be going through property standards with the city of Kingston or if, sh or if you should be going through the landlord tenant board. Okay, so on-campus meal plans, um, these are not my area, but I did just want to mention that this is something, if you are interested in, you can reach out to Dining Services about meal plan options for students living off campus. And if you do live off campus, an on-campus meal plan is not mandatory, but some students do prefer it. So the option is there if you do want to learn more. And um, I did put the uh, link here in the slide but it'd be through dining services at Queens. Okay, and then um, this is my contact information. I do offer one-on-one -on -one appointments, so you're always welcome to email me, um, especially over the next few weeks or the next couple of months as you're navigating, you know, the process of navigating the Kingston rental market and potentially living off campus. Um, feel free to reach out with any questions or concerns or, um, you know, in a few months or even next year, if you're looking for a property off campus, you're more than welcome to reach out. Um, I don't have listings per se, but I can definitely provide you with some resources and do my best to answer all of your questions. So I'm going to hand things now over to May and then um, we'll do questions at the end. Thank you, Marianne, for providing the information. I know a lot of those tips were very helpful in my housing search in Kingston, and they'll be so helpful for our students here or who are watching the recording later. Now, before we get into questions, I want to quickly introduce you to the First Year Off-Campus Community, or OCC. Since it's a great resource for off-campus students to build a sense of community at Queen's, our team and programming offer year-round support to help you succeed in your first year. Students in the OCC will be grouped with one of our upper-year volunteers known as Off-Campus Leaders or OCLs. Your leader will provide tons of opportunities for you to connect with your peers, both in and outside of your assigned groups, during all of our events. They'll also be someone who you can feel comfortable reaching out to if you ever have questions or need some guidance. By being a part of the first year OCC, you'll have access to our summer programming, fall orientation, and year-long events. You'll also have exclusive access to our online community, where you can stay up to date on events happening around campus, find housemates, and so many more cool things. Here are some things you can expect during the academic year. We host weekly lounge hours, the perfect spot for off-campus students to unwind, study, or enjoy a meal between classes. Equipped with a microwave and kettle, the lounge offers all you need to make your time here comfortable. Indulge in free snacks, tea, and hot chocolate as you relax or catch up on coursework. Hosted by our upper-year off-campus leaders throughout the academic year, this is a fantastic opportunity for students to connect with OCLs, seek guidance, and discuss any academic or personal challenges that they may face. Whether you need help with coursework, advice on campus life, or simply want to have a casual chat, our OCLs are here to support and assist you in a relaxed and welcoming environment. 
The off-campus community also hosts a variety of engaging events designed to foster connections and provide enriching experiences for off-campus students. From cookie decorating and crafts to game nights and even movie nights, there's always something happening to keep everyone entertained and involved. These events offer the perfect opportunity to meet new people and make lasting memories throughout your academic year. We also run year-round events to help you stay connected <laughs> to stay connected with each other, starting with our virtual summer socials in July and August, which are listed on this slide, and going into in-person events and orientation, and continuing monthly throughout the fall and winter semesters. I hope to see you at our Welcome to the OCC Virtual Social, Ask Me Anything Virtual Social, and our Social and Games Night. The floor is now yours for the Q&A portion of this webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please use the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen. We will try to answer as many questions as we can, and we also have Mel on the back end who will be answering more specific questions. We also have a list of key resources and contact information up on this slide for you to re refer to throughout this Q&A. So, Let's begin. For our first question, for um, Marianne, where can we see which properties are owned by Queens? That's a very good question. Um, so Queens does, through community housing, um, they have a Queens accommodation listing service. Maybe if Mel can, she can throw that link in the chat for us. Um, but all the Queen's owned rentals would get posted there um, if they're available. Something to keep in mind, though, is Queen's is not only just posting their properties, other landlords um, and property management companies also pay to post there. Um, so you may see their ads as well, as well as students who are in whether they're Queen's owned properties or not. Or Um, I think you're muted there. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, did it just mute? I'm just like a few seconds. Prior. Okay, sorry. Um, so hopefully you heard that. Um, if not, I apologize. One of the big things to keep in mind with the accommodation listing service, I'm going to stay away from my mouse because it tends to click, it makes me mute. Um, is that the properties aren't vetted by Queens. Um, so you still wanna make sure that you're doing the viewings um, to confirm that the property does exist. And the Queens owned properties are clearly indicated showing which ones are owned by Queens. For our next question, how do housemates pay for rent if multiple if there are multiple people in a house? Does each person usually pay their amount to the landlord directly, or do they need to pull the money and send one time to the landlord? Yes, so great question. That actually depends on the individual uh, landlord or property management company. So um, again, it could go either way. I've seen scenarios where the landlord expects um, one payment. So students would designate one person, um, they'd all transfer their money to that one person and they'd make the transfer. But that is a bit more uncommon to my understanding. It is more common um, that each student would then transfer their own payment to the landlord. Something to keep in mind though, is that in uh, joint leases, which typically a lot of these situations are, if one um, student or tenant doesn't pay, the others are responsible. You're all financially responsible because it is a joint lease. So hopefully that answers your question. For our next question here, what if we have a group of four but need one more to rent the house? Could the four of us sign the lease first? And then what happens when we find the fifth? Do we have to ask the landlord for a new lease? Are they obliged to do so? Great. So they're not obliged to do so, but those are all questions that you'd want to bring up in advance when you're discussing with the landlord. So I've seen, again, I've seen both scenarios. I've seen where students have talked to the landlord. 
they sign and then the landlord will um, do like a lease amendment. So it's not a new lease, but they're adding like an amendment to the lease stating that as of this date, this person is joining. Um, or there's been other scenarios where say in this example, four sign and then the fifth person isn't technically going to be on the lease if they choose not to or if the other four decide to go ahead and sign and the landlord doesn't want to do the lease amendment you can still have that fifth person um, but that first fifth person would be more considered a guest or an occupancy situation if they're not on the lease and they wouldn't have rights under the residential tenancies act um, so if there were any issues they would have to leave at and or could be asked to leave at any time because they're just considered a guest. Um, so it is, in my opinion, important to have everybody on the lease. So you want to have those conversations with the landlord in advance, letting them know. Um, and that usually does give you some time to find another person. Um, what you can do, lots of students will, again, go to the accommodation listing service site um, and post that they're looking for another roommate. Some will post in the different social media groups. Regardless of the scenario, please just make sure that you are interviewing housemates in advance and that you're making sure that you're all compatible and that you're all um, having those conversations before you choose which scenario works best for you. Um, to follow up on the rent question, if a person doesn't pay in a joint lease, will the other person's housemates need to pay it on their behalf? Yes, you're all jointly responsible. And if you choose not to pay it, the landlord can um, file with the landlord tenant board to try to evict all of you. So that's the other thing. When you are signing a joint lease, you're all financially responsible. Um, so again, those are questions or conversations you do need to have be having with all of your potential housemates before. Perfect. Next question. I heard that most leases include the summer and we may not be staying for the summer. Are we allowed to rent to other students? How would we do that? Do we need to inform the landlord? And is there a Queens board where we could post on? Is subletting legal? That's a lot of questions in one. Um, right. So leases, again, are typically one year. Um, often they do include the summer, which is unfortunate. Um, a lot of students do leave for the summer. You are able to um, sublet, but a thing to keep in mind is there's a difference. Um, when you have a joint lease, um, you can't technically do a sublet. A sublet, a true sublet is the whole house, the whole apartment, right? Um, so if some of you are staying over the summer and some of you are leaving, that would be considered like an occupancy situation. So you'd want to make sure you're doing a um, like a contract with the other student um, that you're renting your room out to. Um, they would not have rights under the Residential Tenancies Act. Um, and if you do have issues or concerns with that person, um, you would have to take them to small claims court. Um, but you do have the option of renting out your room. Um, students will often refer to that occupancy situation as a sublet, but just again, keeping in mind that that technically is not a true sublet. So you also just want to make sure you are aware of your rights. I don't know if I got all the questions in that one. For the next question, I am on the residence wait list and they are anticipating not being able to confirm until August. Should I find an off-campus house and cancel it if I get off the residence wait list? So I can't speak to the residence wait list, but what I can say when it comes to leases, you can't cancel a lease. Okay, so once you've signed a lease uh, for an off-campus property, it's a legal binding contract and you are locked in uh, for the duration of the lease. So um, yeah, just keep that in mind as you're making decisions that once you sign a lease, you can't break it. What to do if I do not find a place to live before the semester starts? Um, unfortunately, the other options are looking at short-term options. Um, you know, do you have a friend that maybe you could live with temporarily? Looking at hotels, which can be expensive. Um, short-term Airbnb options. Those are really the only things I can think of. Um, but again, at this point... 
Um, I am confident that if you are starting your searching now, you shouldn't have any problems. It does take time though, right? So definitely not something that you want to leave to the last minute. Um, you want to make sure you're putting the time and effort in and definitely don't wait until August. So start looking now. Is there a list of websites that we can look at to find rental properties? Yes. Um, so none of the links or resources are, again, vetted by Queens, um, but they're links that we do know that students are using, and they can be found on the OCLA website in our housing resource package. So if you download the housing resource package, um, all of that information is there, along with a copy of the Ontario Standard Lease for your reference and review, questions to ask during a showing, etc. I have heard about fire insurance. Can the landlord ask for that? Um, so that I'm not confident on. Um, to my understanding, you would be getting like tenant insurance. And I do believe like as a renter, the only thing you'd be um, obligated to get would be tenant insurance. Is there a possibility to contact outgoing exchange students to see whether they are looking for a sublet? So unfortunately, there's not. At Queen's, we're not able to um, provide contact information due to privacy of other students. Um, but that's where you can get creative with social media. Um, again, being aware of scams, though, but lots of students will go to the different uh, Facebook or social media group chats. Um, and there will be postings there if a student's going on exchange or things like that, or checking the Queen's accommodation listing service as well. I heard from another student that December 1st is the date that students usually tell landlords if they're staying for the next school year, but that doesn't sound right according to what I've heard today as it is only 60 days. I'm confused. That's correct. So that's false information. Um, so you are going to see and there's going to be a lot of pressure come um, depending on what your situation is in September, October um, to sign new leases for um you know, next year. So again, please keep in mind of what I said earlier. Um, fixed term leases in Ontario, after the one year or after the eight months, whatever the fixed term date is, uh, all fixed term leases do go month to month. So you are not required to sign a new lease if you want to stay. And again, a lot of landlords will try to pressure you um, if that's the case, please reach out to me. I can help you craft an email in response referencing the Residential Tenancies Act. Um, a lot of landlords I've seen when I reviewed leases have stated a clause in the lease so that you need to let me know by December 1st or November 1st if you are staying again. They can put that clause in, but it's not enforceable and you are not obligated um, to give an answer. Again, all leases in Ontario after that fixed term date, go month to month. Um, and at that time, if you wanna stay, you're going month to month. If you decide prior that you wanna move out, you need to give that minimum 60 days notice before the end of that lease date. Hopefully that answers your question. How much should we expect to pay for rent for a month? Yeah, so I think I gave a bit of an overview, but um, a one bedroom, again, it depends kind of your situation, right? So a one bedroom apartment um, or a bachelor apartment in the city of Kingston, just for context, is anywhere from approximately uh, $1,400 a month to $2,200 a month and up. And a bedroom in a shared property can range anywhere from like $700, $750 to about $1,200. So it kind of depends, um, you know, are you doing the room situation with other roommates or are you trying to find a one bedroom apartment? So um, just keeping those two scenarios in mind, that's where the prices range. This next one I can answer, but it is, when is the first off-campus community event this summer? Can I join if I am not in Kingston? These events are entirely virtual, so anyone can join as long as they um, have that time frame open. Our very first one is July 30th, and it will be from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. And that will be in a slide coming up. 
The last question here for Marianne, do we need to mow the property's lawn? Um, so this is where it's really important that you're reading your lease and reviewing it and understanding it and just, yeah, understanding it is key. Um, so every landlord is different and it'll depend what you agree to in the lease. So it is very common um, that summer maintenance or grass cutting and that would be typically the landlord's responsibility. But again, it you need to check that in your lease. And if it's not in there, you need to find out. Um, before signing. Um, so typically summer maintenance stuff is typically from my experience, the landlord's responsibility or typically they take that on within the lease. But typically winter maintenance is your responsibility. Um, but there are some landlords, again, you have to check your lease because some landlords will take care of the outdoor maintenance both summer and winter. So it really just depends on your lease. And those are questions also when you go for a viewing, ask because you need to find out all of that information so you can make the best decision for you. Thank you everyone for your questions. Unfortunately, um, we do have to say our conclusions now. Um, we encourage you to look at our social media or website for more info. You can also email Marianne at ocla at queensu.ca with any additional questions that you may have. As a quick reminder, we do have many events happening in the next few weeks, including our next webinar, Your First Year Foundation, on June 25th at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. In this webinar, you will meet more student staff from the Student Experience Office and learn about other events and activities happening this summer to help your transition to Queens. On July 3rd at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, we have our first of two upper year Q&A webinars. Our panel of upper year student leaders will be there to answer your questions and give you insights and tips into university life and academics. And finally, we have SOAR, our summer orientation to academics and resources running July 5th to 7th and 12th to 13th. This is a one day on campus program and it is for all incoming first year students and your parents and supporters. Come meet your campus, your faculty, and your peers before the fall. Registration is open now, so scan the QR code before seats are filled. These are just a few of our upcoming events, so make sure to check our rafter and the SEO website for the full lineup, more information, and to register. And just as a final reminder, a recording of this webinar will be made available within the next week on the SEO webpage under webinars. Thank you again to Mary Ann for her time this evening, Mel and Alice for supporting on the back end, and everyone at home for attending. We hope you have a great rest of your evening and we'll see you at our other events.